Boxing King Media in association with Boxer. Delight to be joined by the Iceman, uh, Mr. John Scully, part of Team Arto Betabiev out here in London. Uh, first of all, I've got to ask you, uh, how are you finding your uh, uh, time in London so far? I like London. I like, I like Europe. And uh, yeah, I'm having a good time. I, I've been exploring a little bit, checking things out, and uh, so far so good. How is it different to like you know Montreal or you know where you normally live? How is it different to that? Um, just the whole vibe, you know, especially the architecture. Uh, your buildings are so different. Actually, Montreal is kind of a, a European city, in you know, even though it's in North America, but. Um, you can definitely tell you're in a foreign country when you're in London. You know, the buildings are different, and but I like it. It's interesting because when we go across to the States or Canada, we think the same about right, that side right. of the world. Yeah, so right. I'm glad you're enjoying your stay. So you're here for Better Be A Vested Yard. It's Beast versus Beast. Uh, they're both nicknamed the Beast. But I want to ask you, you know, Artur in the media is always portrayed as the Beast, a scary, intimidating guy. You've obviously been with him from, you know, from, from day dot uh, with regards to his professional career. Just tell us what is the man like behind that persona that, that, that we're told? Well, you know, in, in everyday life, he's, uh, he's very quiet, but in, in the gym, he's, he's, a, he's a really good guy. Like, I'm, I'm struck by him how he's a, a very good person and a really decent person. Uh, you know, he doesn't drink, he doesn't go out to clubs, he's just a family-oriented guy. And, uh, you know, anybody that, that met him would come away saying he was a nice guy. When did your particular journey with him start? You'll have to just correct me. Was it from the moment he joined uh, Mark Ramsey? No, no, a couple of years later. I, I started with him 2016, March of 2016. And uh, so it's been seven years. And how did it come about as, you know, you linking up with the team? Basically, I guess what, what it was, was Arthur wanted someone on the team who had professional experience, but was also a trainer, but, but who had fought before and kind of could relate to him on that level. And uh, Mark knew me and Russ Amber knew me for a long, long time. And so Mark, uh, um, I mean, Russ actually recommended me to Mark and Mark uh, called me and had me come up, and that was in March of, of 2016, and been with him ever since. Amazing. I've got to ask you, you know, the first time you met him, uh, what, what was that meeting like? Because uh, you might have had a preconception ideas of what he may be like because of how he's perceived yeah. with his knockouts. Yeah, no, 100%. I had a, uh, I was, t it's a funny thing, I was told by some, I almost didn't go. Because somebody told me, they said, I don't know, you know, him being a Muslim and from over there, he may not respect you, like as an American or, you know, non-Muslim or something. And I said, ah, well, you know, what's that about? You know, and, uh, but I went and uh, right away, we started the pads, the first round, and we clicked almost instantly. And, you know, just boxing, you know, boxing wise, he could see I knew what I was talking about, I guess, and uh, we had no problems at all. Did, did you ever tell him about that, about, you know, what you was told? And uh, and then obviously when you met, did you ever discuss that afterwards? No, no, I never really brought it up to him. But he, uh, but I, th I, I will tell you one a funny thing that happened. You know, he's known as like a very serious guy. And, and I know religion with some people is a, is a touchy subject, you know, they don't like to joke about it, whatever, And but I like to joke, and, and when I first met him, for some reason, he told me, he, he, he said, uh, he brought it up, and he said, you know, in my religion, I think it was five, he said, you know, we can, we could, if we wanted to, we could have five wives, four, okay, four wives, and I said, I said, listen, there's no way you could stand four of them. And as I was saying it, I was saying, oh, maybe, I, maybe I shouldn't say that, you know, maybe. And he laughed. He, he, he laughed. So it was, it was good. He, he, he got it. But it was just, it was funny that he brought that up to me, you know. Interesting that. Um, how, obviously, you, you got to know him a, a few years after he started his pro journey. But him coming from, like, Chechnya, completely different culture, religion, and the way people live. Uh, how did you see him kind of settling in with his early life in, in Canada? Um, I mean, he seemed pretty well adjusted, but the thing is, he's, he's the type of guy, he doesn't hang out, you know, he's not that type of guy, he's not out there. So, I don't think he had troubles because he wasn't really out among the people interacting, you know, he's home with his family and, and uh, 
He seems to like it. He seems to he seems to like it. I've never I've never gotten the impression ever that he's uncomfortable or anything like that. And then your work with him, uh, obviously Mark's the other trainer. Uh, just tell us, like, uh, from a fan's perspective, you know, what what do you kind of perfect his craft on, and what what bits does Mark do? I think, I mean, Mark is his head trainer, and he Mark handles the strategy for each fight and and, and everything. For me, I I feel like I've, I'm bringing little extra tips, extra strategies, extra techniques that a pro would would use and. Uh, like, like, for, like two things that I think I've added is, one is with his jab, I've added a lot of snap, a lot of strength and snap to his jab. And with the body shots, I've, I've really focused on his body punching and getting more leverage into the punches. And like, like when he stopped Marcus Brown with a good left hook to the body. And we had worked on that exact punch the whole training camp. And uh, in the last fight with the uppercuts with, with Joe Smith, we had worked the uppercuts very hard. So, um, you know, little little things, getting more leverage on his punches and, and things like that is, is kind of what I bring to the table. We see a lot of Instagram footage of him doing these crazy training techniques where he's doing push-ups, you know, I don't even know what they're called, but he's using his fists, his knuckles to like jump, you know, to do the push-ups. And then he's doing like forearm work with the dumbbells. Where does that all come from? I don't know, man. He, uh, I know, I know it's, I know it's in in Russia. They do it. He bring, he's brought a lot of exercises with him from Russia that he's that he's shown me. But he, um, yeah, he does some stuff, man. Like I, I don't even know how it's possible. You know, he throw, he twirls that bar around. It looks like it weighs five pounds the way he does it, but it weighs like forty-five pounds, and he does it like it's a toothpick. Um, you know, he's he's unnaturally strong. You know, he's but he's he's worked a long, long time to get that way. I was looking at the size of his forearms yesterday when he was doing the, the uh, picture shoot, and he's got he's got ridiculously like lean muscles in his forearms, which you don't see in all boxers. Is that the secret to his crazy power? I mean, I don't, I don't know much about the physiological aspects of it, but I do know that his wrists and his forearms are super strong. Because I've done exercises with him. Like, he'll tell me, oh, try this exercise. And it looks easy when he does it. And then I try it, and, and you know, and I fall, you know, I cave in. Uh, so, yeah, he's, his, his arms and his, especially his wrists, you know, really, really super strong. Interesting stuff, uh, and I know you used a British fighter, uh, Callum Simpson and uh, Billy Denise, uh, who were the main sparring partners for this camp. Uh, Callum, I spoke to him a few weeks ago, and he told me an interesting story. Uh, apparently, when he went up on the first day, uh, better be uh, found out that he was English. And he, I don't know if he asked you or Mark, and he said, "Are we sure we're going to use these guys because they might go back and report back to Anthony Yard?" Right, right. Well, you know what's funny? Arthur has a. Uh, you wouldn't think so, but he has a really consistent sense of humor and he was saying it to be funny you know because he knew he knew where they were from you know but yeah he's that type of guy he's almost like his image is like Ivan Drago in the movie but he's really not like that he's really funny he's he's, he's a he's an interesting guy to talk to uh so that's that's just that's just him being funny that's all yeah, I, I picked up on that as well uh, and uh, the Campillo punch can we expect to, have I said that right Campillo punch the Campillo punch. Yeah. I, I saw it in one of the documentaries recently where Mark Ramsey said when he shouts Campillo punch. Oh, oh I think it's the, right, the way he throws the right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's got a few punches <laughs> that he does. But yeah, that was one, uh, the one he, he knocked out Campillo with is one that was practiced in the gym over and over. And so now uh, Mark just calls it the Campillo punch. You know, go, it's a, the go-to punch. Good stuff. Um, I want to speak uh, a little bit about yourself. You know, for the fans who may not know, you know, you fought in an era of all the greats. You know, like Leonard, Roy Jones, when they were all about. And I know I spoke to you off camera. I saw some sparring footage of yourself and Roy Jones Jr. 1988, which probably would have been a prime Roy Jones Jr. I just want to ask you about your experience of how that sparring session came about, and uh, just talk to me about it. Well, at that particular that particular sparring with Roy was at Sugar Ray Leonard's gym in Maryland. Uh, we were. It was right before the Olympics, and Sugar Ray Leonard was interested in signing a certain group of amateurs to go pro, and I was one, and Roy was one. So he brought us all to a training camp 
and we all sparred each other and uh, you know Roy was something and then I started going to Pensacola Florida as a pro and training with Roy and sparring with him for fights there and uh, you know I mean I think Roy's easily one of the top 10 greats of all time for sure what what because obviously when you spied him at that time, you, you, there would have been hype and all sorts around him. Um, how, how did you deal with that and how did you find him as a, compared to the fighters you fought and spied against previous to him? I, I dealt with it really well because I was really anxious to do it. Like I wanted to box with him. You know, I was, I, he was the best and I wanted to test myself against the best and I wanted to see what it was all about. Like he couldn't be there and I didn't box with him. I couldn't let that go. Uh, but he was, he was, he's, he had it all, you know. And as far as dealing with something, with a fighter dealing with, people can say, oh, he threw the, he didn't throw the jab, he threw the hook wrong. Well, dealing with it, it was very hard. I mean, whether he did it right or wrong, it was very difficult to deal with. He was, he was, uh, you know, in many ways, and I think in his prime, maybe the most unbeatable fighter ever, just because of, all that he brought to the table. Interesting. And the last thing I want to ask you is I watched a fascinating story that you told on a, on a YouTube channel a few years ago where you, you was training a fighter who lacked confidence and you made up this protein drink and he gave it to yeah. him before fights yeah. and he believed it was something special but in reality I believe it was just a, a normal drink. Well, what happened was he had a fight coming up and, I, and this kid was very talented and everything but I just knew he needed a little extra and I didn't think he was in great shape for this particular fight. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna give him something. And I'm just gonna tell him that it's rocket fuel, you know? And I gave him some protein powder, which in, in its, of itself is not gonna make a difference. But I gave it to him and he fought a great fight and he won the fight and he just, he told me, he said, man, we, we gotta keep, keep taking that. And I'm like, all right, that's no problem. You know, I'll give it to you every fight. So we went to a fight in Miami Beach and, uh, and I forgot the powder at my house. And so when we got there, we were getting ready to go to the fight. He goes, all right, you, you got the stuff, right? And I said, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. And I said, oh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I'm on the spot. So I went out to Miami Beach and I ran. And I must have ran, I don't know, a mile, a mile and a half. And uh, I finally saw a mini mart, a gas station. And they, had, they sold stuff. So I went in and I remember I bought I bought a bottle of Red Bull, a can of Red Bull. I bought some water and I bought some, I don't know why, but I bought some breath mints. <laughs> and, uh, so I poured some of the water out. I put the, 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 the Red Bull in to give it some taste. And then, I don't know, I, the, the, the mints, I was under the gun. I did the mints, I think, just to give it some, some like a look, make it look like something was in there. And I did that and I shook it up and I ran all the way back to the hotel and I gave it to him and he, uh, and he drank it. And he went out and he won the fight. He looked dynamic and he was like, yeah, we gotta keep taking stuff. We, we got, and he would tell people, Scully's got stuff, but we can't tell you what it is. He didn't even know what it was. <laughs> He's like, we can't tell you what it is. It's our secret. And to this day, unless he saw the video, he never said anything to me, but until he sees, sees this video, He's gonna believe that till he dies. <laughs> you able to say who this fighter was? Uh, his name is Mike, Mike Oliver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, cause I bet you, with your life experience, you're full of stories. Any one particular moment or story you can share about uh, Arto seen as he's fighting this Saturday that you'd probably always remember and uh, you might tell, you know, your grandkids too, that type of thing. Um. You know, it's funny with the, with the boxing, you know, he's, 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 uh, He's just dynamic, you know. But what, but I always know that what I remember about him. I was coming to the gym. This was for the last training camp for uh, Joe Smith, <clears throat> and I was coming to the gym, and I got there a little early, and he was there, and I noticed him outside the gym. So I pull up, but before I got out of the car, I said, "Man, what's this guy doing?" And he's, he was looking at a tree. And I said, "What's he doing?" He's looking at the tree. So I'm watching him watch the tree, and. Uh, and then he pulls out a, like a towel or a mat or something and he puts it down and he goes on his knees and he's praying in front of the tree. And I said, man, and I'm watching him and I'm saying, this is like, this is real. Like a lot of people say they're devoted, and, but this man is real as you, you know, he, a lot, a lot of people wouldn't just 
stop anything they're doing in, in the middle of public to pray on the on, in the grass to a tree. <laughs> but he, he it was that time of the day, and it was time for him to do his thing, and he did his thing. And I always I always respect that about him, and I always thought it was. Uh, you know, indicative of who he is. You know what I mean? And uh, and another time, this is when he first did it in front of me. I didn't know what was going on. We're, we're hitting the mitts, and I'm in the ring. And then all of a sudden, he got out of the ring, and he went in the back. And I go, this freaking guy, what's he doing? And they go, oh, it's uh, 3 o'clock. He's, he's praying. I go, what? They go, oh, don't worry. He'll be back in like two minutes. He'll be fast. And he went, prayed for a minute, came back. We hit the mitts. He didn't say anything. <laughs> we hit the mitts. And, you know, so he's, uh, he's the real deal when it comes to that. You know, he's not just saying it. He, he, he lives it 100%. That's fascinating. I noticed his alarm went off in the press conference on his phone, and I'm suspecting that was probably because it was time to pray. Yeah, oh, yeah, most, that, most likely. Yeah, he's, uh, he's not missing that. <laughs> no, he's taking care of that. John Scully, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you and uh, hopefully you'll come out to Montreal sometime and see you and uh, a big fan of Arsenal, Beck Mahmoudov as well, yeah, yeah, following yeah. his journey and uh, we'll come and speak to you guys soon. Thank yes, you. Sir. All right, I hope to see you there. All right.